Hi, I'm Jeff. I lead AI research and health at Google. I joined Google more than 20 years ago when we were all wedged into a tiny office space above what's now a T-Mobile store in downtown Palo Alto. I've seen a lot of computing transformations in that time, and in the last decade, we've seen AI be able to do tremendous things. But we're still doing it all wrong in many ways. That's what I want to talk to you about today. But first, let's talk about what AI can do. So, in the last decade, we've seen tremendous progress in how AI can help computers see, understand language, understand speech better than ever before. Things that we couldn't do before, now we can do. If you think about computer vision alone, just in the last 10 years, computers have effectively developed the ability to see. 10 years ago, they couldn't see. Now they can see. You can imagine this has a transformative effect on what we can do with computing. So let's look at a couple of the great applications that are enabled by these new capabilities. We can better predict flooding, keep everyone safe using machine learning. We can translate more than 100 languages so that we all can communicate better, and we can better predict disease and diagnose disease so that everyone gets the treatment that they need. So let's look at two key components that underlie the progress in AI systems today. The first is neural networks, a breakthrough approach to solving some of these difficult problems that has really shown in the last 15 years, but they're not a new idea. And the second is computational power. It actually takes a lot of computational power to make neural networks able to really sing. And in the last uh, 15 years, we've been able to have that, and that's partly what's enabled all this progress. But at the same time, I think we're doing several things wrong, and that's what I want to talk to you about at the end of the talk. First. A bit of a history lesson. So, for decades, almost since the very beginning of computing, people have wanted to be able to build computers that could see, understand language, understand, you know, speech. The earliest approaches to this, generally, people were trying to hand code all the algorithms that you need to accomplish those difficult tasks, and it just turned out to not work very well. But in the last 15 years, a single approach unexpectedly advanced all these different problem spaces all at once: neural networks. So neural networks are not a new idea. They're kind of loosely based on some of the properties that are in your real neural systems, and many of the ideas behind neural networks have been around since the 1960s and 70s. A neural network is what it sounds like: a series of interconnected artificial neurons that loosely emulate the properties of your real neurons. An individual neuron in one of these systems has a set of inputs, each with an associated weight, and the output of a neuron is a function of those inputs multiplied by those weights. So pretty simple, and lots and lots of these work together to learn complicated things. So how do we actually learn in a neural network? It turns out the learning process consists of repeatedly making tiny little adjustments to the weight values, strengthening the influence of some things, weakening the influence of others. By driving the overall system towards desired behaviors, these systems can be trained to do really complicated things. Things like translate from one language to another, you know, detect what kind of Objects are in a photo. All kinds of complicated things. I first got interested in neural networks when I took a class on them as an undergraduate in 1990. At that time, neural networks showed impressive results on tiny problems, but they really couldn't scale to do real-world important tasks. But I was super excited. <laughs> I felt maybe we just needed more compute power, and the University of Minnesota had a 32-processor machine. I thought with more compute power. Boy, we could really make neural networks really sing. So I decided to do a senior thesis on parallel training of neural networks: the idea of using many processors in a computer or in a computer system to all work towards the same task, that of training neural networks. 32 processors. Wow, we got to be able to do great things with this. But I was wrong. Turns out we needed about a million times as much computational power as we had in 1990 before we could actually get neural networks to do impressive things. But starting around 2005, thanks to the computing progress of Moore's law, we actually started to have that much computing power, and researchers in a few universities around the world started to see success in using neural networks for a wide variety of different kinds of tasks. I and a few others at Google heard about some of these successes, and we decided to start a project to train very large neural networks. One system that we trained, we trained with 10 million randomly selected frames from YouTube videos. The system developed the capability to recognize all kinds of different objects, and it being YouTube, of course, it developed the ability to recognize cats. YouTube is full of cats. But what made that so remarkable is that the system was never told what a cat was. 
So using just patterns in data, the system honed in on the concept of a cat all on its own. All of this occurred at the beginning of a decade-long string of successes of using neural networks for a huge variety of tasks at Google and elsewhere. You know, many of these things you use every day. Things like better speech recognition for your phone, improved understanding of queries and documents for better search quality, better understanding of geographic information to improve maps, and so on. Around that time, we also got excited about how could we build hardware that was better tailored to the kinds of computations neural networks wanted to do. And it turns out neural network computations have two special properties. The first is they're very tolerant of reduced precision, a couple of significant digits. You don't need six or seven. And the second is that all the algorithms are generally composed of different sort of sequences of matrix and vector operations. So if you can build a computer that is really good at low precision matrix and vector operations but can't do much else, that's going to be great for neural network computation, even though you can't use it for a lot of other things. And if you build such things, people will find amazing uses for them. This is the first one that we built, TPU V1. TPU stands for Tensor Processing Unit. These have been used for many years behind every Google search, for translation. They were used in the DeepMind AlphaGo matches, so Lee Sedol and Koji maybe didn't realize, but they were competing against racks of TPU cards. And we've built a bunch of subsequent versions of TPUs that are even better and more exciting. But despite all these successes, I think we're still doing many things wrong, and I'm going to tell you about three key things we're doing wrong and how we're going to fix them. So the first is that most neural networks today are trained to do one thing and one thing only. You train it for a particular task that you might care deeply about. But it's a pretty heavyweight activity. You need to curate a data set. You need to decide what neural network architecture you're going to use for this problem. You need to like, initialize the weights with random values. You need to apply lots of computation to make adjustments to the weights. And at the end, if you're lucky, you end up with a model that is really good at that task that you care about. But if you do this over and over, you end up with thousands of separate models, each perhaps very capable, but separate from all the different tasks you care about. But think about how people learn. In the last year, I'm sure many of us have picked up a bunch of new skills. I've been honing my gardening skills, experimenting with vertical hydroponic gardening. To do that, I didn't need to relearn everything I already knew about plants. I was able to like, know that, how to put a plant in a hole, how to pour water, that plants need sun, and leverage that in learning this you know, new skill. Computers can work the same way, but they don't today. If you train a neural network from scratch, it's effectively like forgetting your entire education every time you try to do something new. This is crazy, right? So instead, I think we can and should be training multitask models that can do thousands or millions of different tasks. Each part of that model would specialize in different kinds of things. And then, if we have a model that can do a thousand things, and the thousand and first thing comes along, we can leverage the expertise we already have in the related kinds of things so that we can more quickly be able to do this new task. Just like you, if you're confronted with some new problem, you quickly identify the 17 things you already know that are going to be helpful in solving that problem. Second problem is that most of our models today deal with only a single modality of data. They deal with images or text or speech, but not all of these all at once. But think about how you go about the world. You're continuously using all your senses to learn from, react to, figure out what kinds of actions you want to take in the world. It makes a lot more sense to do that. And we can build models in the same way. We can build models that take in all these different kinds of modalities of input data, text, images, speech, but then fuse them together so that regardless of whether the model sees the word leopard, sees a video of a leopard, or hears someone say the word leopard, the same response is triggered inside the model. The concept of a leopard can deal with lots of different kinds of input data, even non-human kinds of inputs like genetic sequences, 3D collides of points, as well as images, text, and video. The third problem is that today's models are dense. There's a single model the model is fully activated for every task or every example that we want to accomplish, whether that's a really simple thing or a really complicated thing. This, too, is unlike how our own brains work. We have different parts of our brains that are good at different things, and we are continuously calling upon the pieces of them that are relevant for the task at hand. For example, nervously watching a garbage truck back up towards your car, the part of your brain that thinks about Shakespearean sonnets is probably inactive. AI models can work the same way. Instead of a dense model, we can have one that is sparsely activated. So that for particular different tasks, we call upon different parts of the model. During training, the model can also learn which parts are good at which things, so that it can continuously identify what parts it wants to call upon. 
in order to accomplish a new task. The advantage of this is we can have a very high capacity model, but it's very efficient because we're only calling upon the parts that we need for any given task. So, fixing these three things, I think, will lead to more powerful AI systems. Instead of thousands of separate models, train a handful of general-purpose models that can do thousands or millions of things. Instead of dealing with single modalities, deal with all modalities and be able to fuse them together. And instead of dense models, use sparse, high-capacity models where we call upon the relevant bits. As we need them, we've been building a system that enables these kinds of approaches, and when we've been calling this system pathways. So the idea is this model will be able to do thousands or millions of different tasks, and then we can incrementally add new tasks, and it can deal with all modalities at once, and then incrementally learn new tasks as needed and call upon the relevant bits of that model for different examples or tasks. And we're pretty excited about this. We think this is going to be a step forward in how we build AI systems. But I also want to touch on、uh, responsible AI. We clearly need to make sure that this vision of powerful AI systems benefits everyone. These kinds of models raise important new questions about how do we build them with fairness, interpretability, privacy, and security for all users in mind. For example, if we're going to train these models on thousands or millions of tasks, we're clearly going to need to be able to train them on large amounts of data, and we need to make sure that that data. Is thoughtfully collected and is representative of different communities and situations all around the world. And data concerns are only one aspect of responsible AI. We have a lot of work to do here. So in 2018, Google published a set of AI principles by which we think about developing these kinds of technologies. And these have helped guide us in how we do research in this space, how we use AI in our products. And I think it's a really helpful and important framing for how to think about these kinds of deep and complex questions about how we should be using AI in society. We continue to update these as we learn more.、Uh, many of these kinds of principles are active areas of research, super important area. So moving from single-purpose systems that kind of recognize patterns in data to these kinds of general-purpose intelligence systems that have a deeper understanding of the world. Will really enable us to tackle some of the greatest problems that humanity faces. For example, we'll be able to diagnose more disease. We'll be able to engineer better medicines by infusing these models with knowledge of chemistry and physics. We'll be able to advance educational systems by providing more individualized tutoring to help people learn in new and better ways. We'll be able to tackle really complicated issues like climate change, perhaps engineering of clean energy solutions. So, really, all of these kinds of systems. Are going to be requiring the multidisciplinary expertise of people all over the world. So connecting AI with whatever field you are in in order to make progress. So I've seen a lot of advances in computing and how computing over the past decades has really helped people better understand the world around them. Millions of people, and AI today has the potential to help billions of people. We truly live in exciting times. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I just I want to follow up on a couple of things. So, it, the, the level of progress. This is what I heard. Most people's traditional picture of AI is that computers recognize a pattern of information, and、uh, and they with a bit of machine learning they can get really really good at that, better than humans. What you're saying is that those patterns of information are no longer the atoms that AI is working with. It's much richer layered concepts. Of, that could in, that in, could include all all manners of types of things that go to make up a leopard, for example.、Mm-hmm. So what what could that lead to? Give me an example of when that AI is working. What do you picture happening in the world in the next five or ten years that excites you? Yeah, I mean, I think the the grand challenge in AI is how do you generalize from a set of tasks you already know how to do to new tasks as easily and effortlessly as possible. And the current approach of training separate models for everything means you need lots of data about that particular problem because you're effectively trying to learn everything about the world and that problem from nothing, right? But if you can build these systems that already are infused with how to do thousands or millions of tasks,、uh, then you can effectively teach them to do a new thing with relatively few examples. And so I think that's the the real hope is that you could then have a system where. You just give it five examples of something you care about, and it learns to do that new task. 
You can do a form of sort of self-supervised learning, yeah. just based on on remarkably little seeding. Yeah, as opposed to needing 10,000 or 100,000 examples to figure everything in the world out. And then, aren't there kind of terrifying unintended consequences possible from that? Well, I think it depends on how you actually apply these systems, right? It's very clear that AI can be a powerful system for good, or if you apply it in ways that are not so great, it can be, you know, a negative consequence. And so I think that's why it's really important to have a set of principles by which you look at potential uses of AI, and and really are careful and thoughtful about how you how you consider applications. Right. I mean, one of the things people worry most about is that if AI is so good at learning from the world as it is, that it's going to carry forward into the future aspects of the world as it is that actually aren't right right now. Oh, and there's obviously been indeed. a huge controversy about that recently at Google. Like well, you. you, you Like some some of those principles of AI development have been, you've been challenged that you're not actually holding to them.、Um, not really interested to hear about comments in a specific case, but、mm-hmm. how are you really committed? How do we know that you are committed to those principles? Is that just PR, or is that real at the heart of your day to day? No, that is absolutely real. Like we have literally hundreds of people working on many of these related research issues because many of those things are. Research topics in their own right. How do you take data from the real world that is perhaps not, you know, the, data, the world as it is, not the world as we'd like it to be, and how do you then use that to train a machine learning model and adapt the data that it is seeing or augment the data with additional data so that it can better reflect the values we want the system to have, not the values that it sees in the world. But you work for Google. Google is funding the research. How do we know that the main values that this AI will build are, are for the world, and not, for example, to maximize the profitability of an ad model? I mean, when you know everything there is to know about human attention, you're going to know so much about the little wriggly, weird, dark parts of us. How, how, in your group, are there rules about how you hold off church-state war between over sort of? You know, commercial push on you must do it for this purpose, so that you can inspire your engineers and so forth to do this for the world, for all of us. Yeah, I mean, our research group does collaborate with a number of groups across Google, including the ads group, the search group, the maps group.、Uh, so we do have some collaborations, but we also have a lot of basic research that we publish openly. You know, we've published more than a thousand papers last year in all kinds of different topics, including many of the ones you you discussed about you know fairness, interpretability of machine learning models. All these kinds of things that are super important, and we need to advance the state of the art in, in this in order to sort of make, continue to make progress to make sure that these models are developed sort of safely and responsibly. Cool. I mean, it feels like we're at a time when there, people are concerned about the power of the big tech companies, and it's it's almost if there was ever a moment to really show the world that that this is this is being done to make a better future. You know, that that is actually key to Google's future as well as all of us. So it's very good to hear you come and say that, Jeff.、Yep. Thank you so much for coming here to TED. Thank、Take、you. Take care, Jeff Dean. Thank you.